Hey folks, if you'd like to support me or this channel, Moose University, in creating more video tutorials, then please consider making a financial contribution at my website, MoofUniversity.com. Thanks and enjoy the video. So in this video I want to begin talking about sphingolipids in more detail. Before we talked about the general structure of a sphingolipid, but they were kind of weird because they showed up under phospholipids and under glycolipids. So here I've done a different general structure of a sphingolipid. It still has the sphingosine backbone, still has the one fatty acid attached, but instead of putting a phosphate and an alcohol or a carbohydrate portion, I know that that is either way uh, the polar head group. So I've just written it here as X, right? So X is going to represent some polar head group. So let's actually see what this looks like. So here is the sphingosine portion in purple. There is the sphingosine portion in purple. And we can see here that if I if I reveal the numbering of these carbons, this first one is carbon number one down here, and then there's two and three. Those first three carbons of the sphingosine backbone are analogous to the situation with glycerol. So glycerol had only three carbons, and those three carbons were the backbone of the structures of the other the other molecules that we've talked about thus far. Here, the first three carbons are pretty much playing the same role as the, the three carbons of glycerol. Now, of course, the rest of these carbons up the top here kind of extend um, extend out this way, um, at least just in this general structure. But that's kind of taking the place of what where the, the fatty acid would normally be in um, uh, the lipids with glycerol backbones. Now, at the carbon number two, at carbon number two, we have the fatty acyl portion, right? And that portion is usually coming from a saturated fatty acid or a monounsaturated fatty acid with 16, 18, 22, or 24 carbons when it comes to sphingolipids. And this acyl group is actually connected here at carbon number two to this nitrogen via an amide linkage. So this here is an amide bond. So at carbon number two, we have an amide bond. Now, over here we have, at the, at the one carbon, we have this O and we have this polar head group being attached. So the nature of this, this polar head group basically determines what kind of sphingolipid we have. So this bond here is, is pretty important. This bond is a phosphodiester bond if X is a phosphate group. or contains a phosphate group. Now, that would mean that this sphingolipid would be a phospholipid, right? Because it would contain a phosphate group. So we'd have a sphingophospholipid or a phosphosphingolipid. I don't know which one, if either one is correct, but both should make the same, same amount of sense to you. But this bond might not be a phosphodiester bond. It could be a glycosidic bond. And it would be a glycosidic bond if X was a sugar or a carbohydrate portion, right? And if that was the case, we'd have a glycolipid. So, or a glycosphingolipid, or a sphingoglycolipid. The point is that either way, it, it should make sense to you what's going on there. Now, what is the simplest substituent that we could have for X? Well, what if it's neither of these? Right? What if it's not, there's no phosphate, and there's no sugar portion? What if it's just an H? Well, then you have what's called the parent compound of the sphingolipid, and its name is ceramide. Okay, cool. So now that we've talked about that, I hope you understand so far the structure of a sphingolipid. Let's talk about the subclasses, the three subclasses of sphingolipids. They are categorized based on what's attached as the polar head group. So we've got sphingomyelins, glycosphingolipids, and gangliosides. So if your X is, is a phosphocholine or a phosphoethanolamine, you have a sphingomyelin. Okay. And sphingomyelins are present in the plasma membranes of animal cells. And there's lots of them in myelin. Myelin, you might know, or you might not know, is, is what helps uh, insulate axons of certain neurons. And so, because myelins are, uh, sphingomyelins are especially prevalent in there, 
they're actually given the name sphingomyelins because of that, okay? um, because of their prevalence in the myelin sheath. So that's sphingomyelins. If you have phosphocholine or phosphoethanolamine, right, you have these, this, these, guys, these guys, because they have the phospho portion, right, these are phospholipids or sphingophospholipids. So they are phospholipids. Now, glycosphingolipids basically is when the X is one or more sugars. Okay, so if you have one sugar or more sugars, you have a glycosphingolipid. But now, um, now these glycosphingolipids are also called uh, neutral. They're called neutral glycolipids, and we'll get to why in just a second. Um, in fact, I'll even mention it now. They're called neutral glycolipids because when you attach a sugar as the polar portion, these sugars don't have charges, right? So there's no there's no nowhere else in the in a sphingosine or or in the or in the fatty acid chain, right? There's no other place where there's a charge. So if the sugar that you're adding doesn't have a charge, which sugars don't have don't carry a charge, then you have a neutral molecule overall. So these these glycosphingolipids are going to be also called neutral glycolipids. Sphingomyelins, as you might imagine, because they have that phospholipid, they're not always neutral, right? Um, okay, so now this is one or more sugars is 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 if the X right um, is equal to that. So it's further classified. So glycosphingolipids are made up of cerebrosides and globosides. Cerebrosides basically when you have just one sugar. So let's kill that S there. Right? And globoside is when you have two or more sugars. Okay. So cerebrosides, if the one sugar is a glucose, the one sugar is a glucose, you'd expect that 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 membrane lipid uh, or that cerebroside specifically to be present in non-neural plasma membranes. If that X is instead galactose, right, if the one sugar that's attached is galactose, you'd expect that to be present in neural plasma membranes. Now, globosides have two or more sugars attached as that X polar head group. So that X can be a combo of, uh, of glucose, you could have galactose, you could have um, n acetyl beta galactosamine. Um, the point is that you would have two or more sugars attached as the polar head group. And these glycosphingolipids are actually important for blood typing. So like A, B, and O. A, B. So these are important for blood typing. Fun fact. Okay. Now on to the, the next class is gangliosides. And these are actually the, the most complex of the bunch. Now, X is an oligosaccharide with at least, at least is in all caps there, one N-acetyl neuraminic acid, which is abbreviated as NEU5AC, um, which is a sialic acid. What does that even mean? An oligosaccharide basically means you have multiple, multiple uh, sugars attached, right, in a link. Um, and there's at least one of these sialic acids. And I'll actually show you a sort of depiction of each of these in the next video. I just don't want this video to be too long. So each of these um, these these sialic acids carries a um, a negative charge, a negative charge at a pH seven. So they're not they're not like globosides or or cerebrosides. So um, the first thing is that the reason why I put only unlike globosides here is because cerebrosides only have one sugar. Globosides have two or more sugars. So globosides and ganglosides are can be fairly similar in their structures because globosides will have may have you know three sugars and the ganglioside might have three sugars. The difference between them is simply that ganglosides will carry this sialic acid and the sialic acid will give it a negative charge. So it's not going to be neutral like a globoside. Hence unlike globosides. So ganglioside, you can kind of imagine them as globosides with this acidic portion and therefore will have uh, a negative charge. Now ganglioside can sometimes be classified based on their series which is the series is based on the number of the sialic acids that are attached to in that polar head group portion. 
So if there's one sialic acid, it would be called part of the GM series, which would probably be gangliosside mono. If there's two, two sialic acids, you'd have GD, D, di, meaning two. Um, if there's three of them, GT, tri, four of them, GQ, quart, or quat. Um, basically, they're classified for the number of sialic acids that are contained in that certain polar head group. So I hope that video was helpful, and in the next video we'll talk about uh, some examples of these structures. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching. Yo, if you found that video helpful, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe for more content, and if you know anybody who might find the videos helpful, then please share it with them. Thanks, happy studying.